books have been published, and they are Print Areas, 2004, Movable Types, 2008, New World Order, 2011, and Founds of <coughs> Knowledge, 2015. A fifth volume under this series is under preparation, and he was uh, also Associate Editor for South Asia for the Oxford Companion to the Book, which was published in 2010. His bibliography and location register of all books printed in Bengal and in Bengali from 1801 to 1914 is now the basis of the two centuries of Indian print project at the British Library London. His latest book, The Spread of Print in Colonial India into the Hinterland, was published in 2021, recently, and it is published from the Cambridge University Press. Um, so we are privileged to have with us Professor Vijit Gupta, and I request him to take his seat here. I also request uh, Dr. Shabdi Goho, Director ISR, to formally greet uh, the speaker, Professor Vijit Gupta. So without wasting further time, it is over to you. Go um, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Gurun and Professor Burkhaisto for uh, those words of welcome and indeed uh, inviting me to say a few words uh, about uh, and or actually join this colloquium uh, on, on archives in general and uh, um, the theme of shared goals among diversities in particular. I mean, and we've already, the colloquium has actually already begun. We have had very interesting conversations with some of the attendees, and I am very hopeful that today will be uh, very enriching for all of us, particularly me. Uh, my, uh, as you can see, though I am here representing the School of Cultural Texts and Records, I'm not really an archivist or a conservationist or librarian. Uh, by training, I'm a, I'm a literature, I, I teach literature for a living. And therefore, my whatever I will say today, uh, uh, it's not really from a uh, position of expertise, but rather some questions that have occurred to me, both as a, scholar, as a, as a literary historian, and also as someone who uh, somewhat accidentally has been entrusted with the responsibility of the School of Cultural Texts and Records, um, uh, which uh, in fact completed, completes 20 years this year. It's a two decade long uh, organization, part of Jagat University. And if there is time at the end of my uh, lecture, that we are, I'll play a very short video on what we do at ACTR, but uh, that is not my chief focus today. In fact, um, <clears throat> uh, what I will say is uh, well, what I will raise a number of questions and issues, even you could call them problems about um, the state of archiving. In, in um, and these are general questions, not just questions which are restricted to our part of the world or South Asia. Um, and uh, some of you, to some of you, these questions might seem somewhat old-fashioned, and we it, we it would seem that we are I'm walking in a somewhat uh, uh, backward direction. And and it is perhaps possible that these questions are very easy answers and that these questions are in fact unnecessary but nevertheless I will raise them and uh, I'll, let's see how they uh, how, how what you think about them now um, before I go further I would uh, also like to congratulate the Institute of Language Studies and Research on their you know very good news of last night uh, the endangered archives program uh, the grant made by the endangered archives program but that also gives me a good starting point that the AP, in short, uh, over the last 10 or 15 years has been a major impulse for carrying out digital archiving in our part of the world. Uh, it is, uh, it's not just the funding that the Endangered Archives program has provided, but it's also established a common set of practices, what we might call good practices, um, both at the technological level as well as ethical levels of ethics, consent, access, and issues of custodianship, and so on and forth. Um, and uh, I remember that in 2010, I may get the exact date wrong, in 2010 I was part of a 
uh, very wide-ranging discussion at the National Library of uh, Kolkata, which was chaired by uh, the then uh, Director General, Professor Shapun Chakraborty. Uh, it was, and it was co-hosted by the British Library London. And there, there was an attempt to um, discuss what might be a common minimum program for digitizing in uh, South Asia. Again, this was a, this was a very fraught meeting in many ways. And one of the, uh, I think, one of the things which was then points which were then raised by us that we were many smaller and larger institutions were doing their own digitization projects in various ways. I mean, with varying varying degrees of um, different parameters, and whether it would be possible a to stop reinventing the wheel in many cases, repeating what we were already doing. And B, uh, bring, uh, introduce a common set of parameters, te primarily technological parameters, protocols, workflows. And C, bring all stakeholders to a kind of a com on the same page. Now, this didn't really happen. But I'm reminded of that because in the last 10 or 12 years, I think, you know, if you think of, uh, it has been a generally a good time for archiving. We have been, we were just discussing this in the other room, this proliferation of archives in the last decade, um, primarily digital archives. And which have become uh, for a large range of material, uh, you know, manuscript, print, sound, you know, visual material, um, 3D objects, even uh, or oral histories. All of these have been done, and not just by uh, institute, you know, institutes of research, but also smaller, smaller archives, family archives, crowdsourced archives. All these have become easier to do because of the technological tools that are now available to us, to the digital tools of tools of digitization as well as communication that are available to us. And therefore, we, the ecosystem of archiving has under, underwent, undergone a change. And I think that mapping also, as two of uh, colleagues from the university were just mentioning, that is something which needs to be done because this is a very complex uh, uh, ecosystem. Now, but as I said, my <laughs> aim here is, again, you know, while, you know, this is a good thing that is happening while funding for digital archives is, uh, digital, uh, creating digital archives is uh, becoming more and more available. The expertise, um, you know, you also need trained, these are all very labor intensive initiatives. You need trained personnel to carry these out. You constantly need to update the, uh, update yourself in the method, in, in the technologies that you're using. At the same time, I will, as I said, talk about some very, fairly old fashioned concerns. And part of that comes from my own um, experience as a literary historian. My work has not been, my research work has not so much been with textual hermeneutics or the actual literary text, but rather with the processes which surround it. So when, and this again goes back a long, some two or three decades, so again it's perhaps not fair to sort of uh, use my experience of the 1990s and 2000s to, uh, in a sense, talk about uh, the end user of the archive. You know, in this case, of course, there are many users of any archive. Scholars are only one among a large number of groups who may use an archive. But I'm again speaking from the point of view of scholarship. Now, one of the, when I was working in the early 2000s, so this part of the lecture will be about my own uh, research and the archival issues that I sort of dimly perceived at that time. One of the things, uh, since I was looking at the rise of print in colonial South Asia, particularly what was then Bengal, uh, the Greater Bengal, um, one had to depend on uh, whatever archive that was possible. Now, it, it's also a common place that in many cases, colonial South Asian archives have not, not survived. So, you know, when you're looking at the history of printing or publishing as I was, you are dependent on A, the missionary archives, and B, on the imperial archives. That is to say, uh, it is very difficult to find, um, let us say, publishers' archives. You know, let us say, if you think of the Bortola, Bortola printing, what, the very few material traces, other than the books, other than the printed material, remained of them. So I had to depend very extensively on, um, at least, on the missionary archives, particularly the work of the Baptist missionaries in Sri Lanka in the first three decades of the 19th century. Their archives uh, have been deposited primarily in one small theological college in Oxford called the Regents, Regents Park College and is uh, part of a collection called the Angus Collection. Now, one of the first things I think any South, South Asian historian is, has to be aware of when dealing with the archive is to 
be very very wary of how much of the earth that you take at its value indeed you have to read we have been told repeatedly you have to, to read between the lines you have to look for the exclusions as well as inclusions omissions and erasures that are very clear in a sense you have to try and read absences in the archive now that becomes difficult i mean the architecture of an of of an archive the hierarchy of an archive the way it was put together all of this is not usually available to us this knowledge is not usually available to us how does an archive get together how accidental is the deposit deposition of a particular archive how to what what method or lack thereof attended the way in which the archive was the physical archive here we are talking about the raw physical archive how was it put together so when one was looking at for instance the baptist archives in regions park college one was struck by its disorganization there was an attempt to catalog them but it was not a very concerted attempt there were um, there were um, and you, you also were aware of a particular kind of arrangement of boxes files um, uh, you know envelopes and so on and forth as kind of meta as as small of the smaller units of storage that very fact of physical storage how certain papers were stored became part of the narrative what when what goes into a particular box what gets taken out of a box is there an integrity to that physical arrangement of that archive or is it all accidental but the problem with the baptist archives was in fact uh, compounded by the second world war so when this baptist archive was being microfilmed by another organization in texas or mississippi i forget who they said that i'm reading a little bit from that uh, their 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 website where they talk about the uh, range of the archive so they are talking about missionary correspondence relating to india africa china and west indies missions of the baptist mission so that's a very large area the um, the particular microfilm or microfiche that they had was file filmed from the original catalog prepared by the society in 1964 65 so you're looking at a catalog which was started its life in 1792 i mean the life of the baptist missionary archive of 1792 to the middle of the 19th century uh, so and it comprised primarily um, loose correspondence some bound volumes of correspondence reports publications topic topical files and uh, their printed output now these papers were resorted after the second world war when bombing and hasty salvaging efforts destroyed all provenance now of course this is unavoidable i mean you know, you're being bombed you don't have time to maintain the integrity of the physical archive they were rearranged into units under the missionaries names so then they became an alphabetical catalog of missionary and every paper every bit of paper was sort of filed under the name of one particular missionary very few post 1840 papers survive although this is assumed to be accountable to poor contemporary filing rather than to the second world war bombing so again this is one this one example of i'm sure something which many are the acts of war acts of nature what happens to the original provenance what happens to the original storage of the archive that is something that is a, and I'll, I'll come back to this later because i think that the, the the record of the archive is also part of the archive story it's not just what the archive is telling us um, through its constituent elements but it is equally important for us to know how an archive was put together or how it again was dispersed the story of storage and dispersal is perhaps as compelling in many some cases as the story that the archive tell now and there were other kinds of uh, challenges let's say so in the case of the baptist missionary archive one could or i could visit it on site at the uh, regions park college but when we were earlier in the 1990s when i was doing research in uh, uh, cambridge university there were also publishers archives we had to work with which again we either worked with hard copy or with the microfilmed versions of those so for example the macmillan archives which has been deposited with the work collection in new york had a um, microfilm counterpart in the cambridge university library but then again there were problems with looking at or working with um, again i i do not want to overemphasize the word problem of course i mean there there are problems with working with any archives but you see the issue was that how much was left out how much was actually committed to microfilm 
this information was not available anywhere. My colleague Rini Chatterjee was then working at with the Oxford University Press papers. She was in Oxford, she or she could go and visit the Walton Press, uh, the Walton Street Archive in Oxford. Also found out that at that time there were many commercial organizations which were preparing these microfilm or microfiche, uh, and they were. And this, this was a, this was these were not carried out by academic institutes, but by commercial institutes, and they would leave out what they thought would not be commercially viable. For instance, and again, this is hearsay, but what I learned then was that these, the, the commercial organization which had approached Oxford University Press for to, for you to digitize its, not digitize, uh, to, to microfilm its voluminous archives, said that we don't want to do the Bible trade, because that's, that's kind of something we don't find any use for the Bible. The Bible trade was a huge part of the uh, work of the Oxford University Press. It made us a tremendous amounts of money. Now, if you know, if you're not going to do the papers of the Bible trade, then you are, in a sense, doing harm to the integrity of the archive. Now, again, this we at that time sought in vain for this kind of let's say health warnings that this microfilmed archive comes with these problems. See, often of course we could also see the problem that you know you, it is not possible to commit everything to a uh, to, 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 to a kind of a copy because of you know questions of economy. Now, in this context, therefore, and, you know, at that time, digitization had not yet become a solution, become a tool for, the, for, for working with such archives. And then now that we have the option of creating digital archives, uh, is, has this problem been solved? Um, is there a solution that we can accept? Or are there um, new kinds of issues which arise? And I'm going to sort of talk about one or two you see the digital archive, and especially again, uh, we were talking about the endangered archives program, which has a very clear kind of a parameter or protocol, whatever call it, of capturing of the image, <coughs> its storage, and the writing of the metadata. Now these are the three things which are three different functions which have to be carried out according to certain parameters. Now, but the question is, what is the architecture of the digital archive? How is it arranged? Does it follow the logic of the physical archive? You see, the physical archive, I argue, also has a certain logic of logic, the way in which it is put together. That logic is perhaps, to a certain extent, lost at the digital level, where every item is disaggregated. Everything becomes one. You break it down to single pages. So in a sense, when we are writing metadata, and perhaps Vijit who is there will also work with many endangered archives program will be able to confirm this, that when you are putting it online, a search, internet search leads you to that one page. Now, how do we do the linking with the rest of the pages and not just the rest of the pages, well, maybe the box or maybe the collection to which this belongs. So you see the, a certain kind of logic or illogic, whatever you may call it, attended the building of the physical archive and sometimes there is this, I think there is this possibility that in the digital archive, we might lose that narrative, that kind of, that sense of the physicality of the archives. There is a, and in the, even in the physicality of the archive, there's a hierarchy, there's a bias, there's a certain kind of spatial um, politics which is at work. Um, so how does the digital archive reproduce that? And that is, I think, a challenge with when many of us, we work with, uh, 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 you know, we, when we break down the archive into granu most granular forms, a single page, when you, are, when you are actually doing that single page, you are writing the metadata. In many cases, you are actually writing a metadata for a single page. Now, that single page may be a letter which belongs with 30 other letters, which may be part of an ongoing correspondence, which belongs to a file, which belongs to a box. Now, again, I'm wondering whether this guy, somehow we, could, we can find a way to, in a sense, give a sense of that physical archive as well, and its histories, and its vicissitudes, and its contingencies, when we are making or creating the digital archive. So how do we link? these individual files. Again, as I said, these might be very naive questions and there may be very simple solutions to this, simple digital solutions to this, but you know that I'm sure in the question answer session. Then, and I think this is the point which worries me most about the digital archive, is its unmediated nature. In other words, the lack of an archivist. This is something which I feel is, you see, we leave, we are leaving the work of the archivist to the technology. And now we are talking about artificial intelligence also which will now be perhaps used more and more as a as, as, a, as a tool to, cat, to catalog, to categorize, 
uh, and in a sense play the role of this mediator. Now, when we are creating a digital archive, putting it up on the internet, putting it up, making it available to all kind, any user that wants to, do we, is there a need for mediation? Is there a need for a trained archivist who will in fact know the way about the archive and will be able to direct the user in an informed way? Now, in our country, again, I mean, we have a very uh, veteran archivist here, um, and there are several archivists, uh, people who work, work with archive, but we have perhaps not taken the role of the archivist as seriously as we should have uh, within our uh, uh, ecosystems. And indeed, this is not just true of our country. I mean, even if you, even if you look at the West, the role of the archivist, when, you know, if you think of the British Library, it was often the keeper, the keeper of this, the keeper of that. It's almost as if you're, the role of the archivist is either that of an honest broker or a tour guide. But you're, you're keeping these things so that scholars can come and work on them. Now, this, these points were raised in a 2011 article by the very famous Canadian archivist, Terry Cook, uh, called, in an article called The Archive is a Foreign Country, which came out in the journal American Archivist, which is a passionate plea for uh, considering the role of the archivist beyond what was traditionally understood by the role of what we might call the keeper, the flesh and blood archivist who will be also carrying out research on the archives, not just, not merely a custodian, not merely a temporary or permanent custodian, but somebody who is in a conversation, in a scholarly conversation with the material itself. Now again, I was discussing this possibility with some of my colleagues in the, in the School of Cultural Texts and Records. Let us say, why does the AP program, can we tell, can we ask the AP program? And uh, recently we have been carrying out a number of uh, training programs on behalf of the Endangered Archives program, right? because SDR, that is to say, the school is now the South Asian hub for uh, the AP program. So our chief task is to, in a sense, uh, encourage stakeholders' perspective um, applicants uh, to apply to this program and also provide some kind of um, basic know-how about how to apply for a grant. But once if you're, when you're successful, successful with the grant, how to go about um, you know, using various kinds of uh, technology, software, and so on and forth. Now again, the question is whether such programs or such should also include some kind of a research component that you carry out the you know, meat and potatoes digitization as it were, the raw data, you sort of write the metadata. And at the level of metadata, of course, there is a scholarly kind of a intervention necessary. Uh, and in certain cases, these interventions go beyond scholarship. They go uh, for, so I'll just give an example. Recently, we have been uh, digitizing the, um, not just papers, but memorabilia of one of the greatest Indian sports people, Gurbak Singh, who we know was part of three Olympic gold medal-winning hockey teams. Now, we have been doing his, we have been going, a team from our SCTR has been going to his residence, uh, digitizing not just, not just newspaper reports and photographs, but also 3D objects such as shields, medals, blazers, hockey boots, hockey sticks, and so on and forth. Now, in many cases, only Gurbak is able to say who this group of players is from left to right. You know, you've got a clipping from somewhere in 1960 Rome Olympics. No one knows who those people are except the hockey player himself. There are many cases where you are dependent on this kind of individual memory, where you cannot find any kind of supporting evidence. Now, again, in this case, you, you, you are also involving, in a sense, somebody like the, 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 the sports person themselves to be part of that scholarly conversation and to be part of that creating that metadata. Now when we are so when we are doing this creating this metadata, we are therefore not merely trying creating metadata, but we are also sort of creating or planting the seeds for a future future scholarship. Now again my my question is this how does how, to what extent can we provide archival services, archivist services for the digital media that we're creating, the digital archive that we're creating. In the case of SCTR, um, we have some physical holdings. Some of those physical holdings have been worked on by researchers. So for example, uh, at least two or three doctoral theses have been done on the Silatinagri material that we uh, digitized and published. 
Shudhindranath uh, Dutta papers have been worked on uh, both. Uh, the, uh, 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 Shubhato Sinha has uh, put, had, did a PhD as well as published a book on the on Shudhindranath Dutta. There have been other books on Shudhindranath Dutta, but we also there are also archives which are lying there without any scholarly attention, and without a scholarly without people asking for inquiring for researching. Publishing on archive and archive is meaningless, it's inert. An archive gets life only when people return and look at it. People use it in various ways. That need, that use need not be scholarly. Um, in this context, I mean, if you, there is a, uh, um, a historian, David Lauenthal, in a book called uh, The Past is a Foreign Country, he talks about the marvelous account of how in the 19th century this, uh, and perhaps at the beginning of the Romantic period, this keen sense of the distinction between the past and the present began to enter our consciousness, that we are aware of the past. Again, the Romantics were also very, very, you know, if you think of the Romantic poets, they were disenchanted with the present. For them, much of the Romantic project was, in fact, an investigation of the past. And certain kinds of nostalgia, certain kinds of retelling, revisiting, recreating the past began to become a preoccupation. So if you're looking at one of the archival impulses in the West, for instance, the 19th century, of course, that's a long period. But the early 19th century does provide a moment where the sense of past becomes, in a sense, uh, much more distinct than it was before. And therefore, when we are also looking at archives, I think there are two senses of the past which are possible. One is, of course, the raw material, the raw data that the archive uh, presents in front of us. That this is this is from this is where from where you reconstruct the past. Um, but again, um, and, and there I think the role of, and I, this, you may consider this section of my uh, presentation, the plea for more archivists, that we do need, we just do not need digital records, we also need people who can interpret those records, who can, in a sense, uh, show the way to scholars around them. And this traditional disjunction between scholarship and, uh, and, and the archivist, this is, more bridges need to be built. And uh, of course, uh, occasionally, uh, archivists have published. They have worked um, as scholars as well. Think of uh, the uh, former director of the, uh, uh, the former uh, of the Asian and African collections in the British Library, Graham Shaw, who has published extensively throughout his, uh, both his career as, a, uh, as, as an ally librarian, as an archivist, and continues to do so. Uh, but there has always been a kind of a, especially among historians, I think, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean doing maybe not all historians, but it's almost as if that this, here is the archive, we can work on it, and we don't need to think about anything else, about the people who put, put this archive together. And in this context, I also feel the second sense of our past is, has to be um, a history of the archive, uh, what we might call um, there's a need of the history for the record. How does, and this again, my own experiences working as a researcher brought home to me. Uh, and increasingly when you work in spaces like the British Library or, you know, or, or depositories set up by colonial powers, you're constantly struck by the phenomenon of the historical diaspora of material. Material which once belonged here has gone there. We know that, I mean, the British Museum, other museums, now there is a, a kind of a repatriation or a restitution which is going on, Benin, the Benin bronzes, for instance. But also, the history of this diaspora becomes part of the history of the archive itself. How do we make sense of that? How do we, 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 we look at objects on a shelf, which we can then, you know, call up through a requisition slip. But how does that, what is the history of that? So, I, I'll give you again a personal example. Uh, several years ago, when I was working, I, mean, I, I think uh, uh, Anindo mentioned the two centuries of Indian print project, which Momita, who is sitting here, has been a project fellow for almost five or six years. And uh, one of the things which we were doing in this project was to, uh, was in a sense, uh, abs the, 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 um, uh, we were looking at, or we were trying to digitize, unique material pertaining to Bengali printing in the collection of the British Library in the School of Oriental and African Studies. Which meant that if you, let us say, if between 1801 and 1867, uh, which is 
the Press and Registration Act, Act 25 in India. So the reason why that act is important is that after that, there is a kind of bibliographic control. We know what books were printed because it became mandatory for any printer or publisher to register their works with the British Raj. You have to, and that was published as a quarterly return by the Calcutta Gazette. Now before that, there are roughly about two and a half thousand, very roughly, 10 plus minus 10 percent plus probably, uh, Bengali books which were published or printed. And we have, we have some idea about how, where they are located. Which are the titles which are unique to, let us say, the major depositories, the Bongya Shait, the Polish Shait, the National Library, the Jai Krishna Library, and then the British Library. So in that way, we were able to identify the gaps, um, that is, the works which were not available in India or South Asia. And therefore, those works were prioritized. Now again, but this again also created a kind of completely, and, and that's, that's the kind of tricky part. It's also created a canon within a canon of works which have been digitized and now are easily available. And which again, to a certain extent, was based on an objective assessment of what books were not available in South Asia, therefore access needed to be arranged, access needed to be facilitated. But to a certain extent, it was also subjective in that, especially in the post-1867 period, where, like I said, there were two and a half thousand books from 1801 to 1867, that figure increases massively after 1860s. I mean, you know, if you look in 1867 to 1914, the figure is about 10 times as many. Now then you have to, in a sense, look at the British Library titles and say that, and yourself prioritize that, okay, these are more culturally important. And then the question of diversity becomes very important, that how do you make this choice? How do you prioritize what is more important for digitization and therefore create being part of a digital archive? And in many cases, it had to be a very subjective judgment. So we were looking at the titles and uh, also let me here also uh, talk a little bit about um, some of the practical problems. You see, in the case of this two centuries of Indian print project, the digitization that were taking place, we were in identifying particular titles. Okay, so let's say uh, the first book of gymnastics in Bengali from 1880s. Now, you would often find that that particular work would be bound with some other book volumes. You see, the one reason why smaller works have su survived in the British Library in the India, India Office Collection is that they were all stitched together and bound in a Samuel band. Uh, and sometimes, of course, this again did damage to the actual size of the book because you had to all trim it to the trim it to a common size, but still it survived. Now, therefore, what the imaging system of the library would do, they would, they would image the entire book, not just those 20 or 40 or 60 pages. So you might actually have a digital copy of 11 or 12 other books. Now, you say, oh, that's great. I mean, you know, more the merrier. But that could not go into the <coughs> digital archive. Only the chosen volume would go into, chosen title would go into it. And there's a kind of graded process. First, you have to create the metadata. Then the metadata data has to be ingested into the British Library catalog. And then after ingestion, there is the actual the whole the full text goes into the catalog. Now, for this, and it's a one window system. Everyone is queuing up for ingestions. So, you know, Latin books, Arabic books, etc. So, this is a slow process and not perhaps the most ideal process. Uh, but, so, what you see in the two centuries of Indian print project, let's say 1600 or 1700 titles, the actual digitized quantum is 10 times more. But we have chosen those 1600 titles and left out those the remaining 90% because A, they're either repetitions or B, they're not important enough or C, they have already exist in some South Asian library. Now, this is a very hit and miss process. The best thing would have been for them to upload them all, but apparently that costs a lot of money. That there's, you need personnel and so on and forth. This has been one of the frustrations also of, very, let me say very frankly, of working with the Two Centuries Project is that so much has been digitized and so little has been made available. Um, this, of course, um, I, I, it would not be, uh, I, I should be feeling in my duty if I didn't mention the other work that this project did, and that was uh, to create an OCR for uh, Bengali, Bengali script. Uh, many of you will know how difficult it is to create OCR for uh, Indic script. 
I remember an uh, conference organized by Professor Shukanta in 2005 or 6 in the Alok University, where this was in fact what we were discussing, the problem of reliable OCR, especially for 19th century, pre-1850, whereas pre-1860, just before Bengali spelling and orth um, typography was standardized by Vidya Shagur, uh, maybe perhaps just before this period is the most challenging. And, uh, uh, because of the various kinds of typography, the Srinampo typography, the uh, uh, Calcutta Baptist typography, and so on and forth. So, again, in the two centuries project, that is, I believe, something which, within which they have uh, which they have achieved a degree of success, training the AI, in this case, the software, um, the pattern recognition artificial intelligence, because you have to train, you have to keep training that artificial intelligence in order to recognize um, the Bengali type or the non-Roman type as correctly. Sometimes in the case of books from 1810 or 1820, it is possible for Google Doc, which is which also has an inbuilt OCR in it, to recognize Bengali's uh, script as Devnagari. Uh, but then these are sort of maybe a few years ago. Now, the so when we were doing this, sorry, I digressed a bit, when we were doing this, carrying out this two centuries project, then the, again the question of how the books uh, got to the India Office collection, the history of the collection itself became compelling. So for instance, in the pre-1867 period, the collections of India Office, um, and then post-1867 period, the quarterly reports, the quarterly returns, from the Calcutta Gazette, somebody would select from them. There were pencil marks. If you look at the digitized version of the quarterly report, there are, there are thick marks. Somebody would, I think the librarian, um, the, Bengal, the Bengal library would sit and actually mark up books which would go to the India Office collection and which would then be part of that record. Questions also arise about uh, proscribed books, books taken out of circulation or books which are outside the law, which were not registered. And there are all these unanswered questions. Of course, again, I mean that quantum of titles is perhaps not very much. So, but this story of how a collection is put together um, is also, I think, a part of that archival record. And the reason I'm, the one instance where it came sort of struck home was, again, during two centuries work, um, I was occasionally allowed access to the shelves, stacks of the British Library which go down like Dante's hell, uh, nine, <laughs> nine circles, or, or several several stories into, into the underground. And there, one day, completely casually, I saw a number of volumes, bound volumes on a shelf, uh, which said Mahabharata and Wilson. Now, the Wilson Mahabharat, no such thing exists in print. Uh, Horace Heyman Wilson, as you know, was one of the uh, great Orientalists translated and uh, Vishnu Purana and a lot of Indian uh, uh, texts from classical antiquity was involved in various kinds of uh, uh, scholarly projects during the 1820s and 30s. But then it turned out that about a dozen volumes, uh, manuscript volumes of the Mahabharat in English translation uh, was found in the shelves of the British Library. Now we know that the first translation, English translation of Mahabharat was done in the 1880s. Uh, and it was, uh, Putak Chandra Rai's, I, I may get the name wrong, uh, 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 gratis edition, very lavishly produced, which was, um, so what was, a, and this was from the 1830s, the early 1830s, no, early 1830s, Dronapar, Dronapar, Vishma Parva, all the separate Parvas, Parvas were, so then I started looking into this um, and I found that none of the Mahabharat scholars uh, actually had mentioned this uh, Hunter Mahabharat, uh, sorry, Wilson Mahabharat, though there was a very detailed catalogue entry, printed catalogue entry in the British Library on the shelves where obviously someone who knew, who had studied these manuscripts wrote a several page long catalogue entry describing each volume. Um, there not their omissions, I mean, they, this, was, this was not the complete uh, translation of Mahabharata, and I'm, I, I, I have no Sanskrit, I have no idea, even till this point, to what percentage of Mahabharata was translated in that way. 
and it also said it was translated for Horace Heyman Wilson, not translated by Wilson. And then it turned out that there was a further set of such copies in the, Brit in the uh, Oxford Bodleian Library, which were a rough notes for this sequence of Mahabharata. Now, so how did this come about, and how, what, what was the provenance of this, these particular rough Mahabharata? So, this, so what I found, the answer, and the very partial answer was this, that after Wilson died in 1860, and I'm just giving this an example of, you know, sometimes when this this side, this question becomes even more compelling. How did it, after Wilson's death in 1860, in the library of the Asiatic Society of Bengal in Calcutta, somebody, a scholar called J. Talboy Wheeler, he was going through the catalog and suddenly came across these entries, and he found them miscatalogued, and this is often a case. You, 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 this cataloging is, somebody should write history of this cataloging. For example, uh, uh, I was speaking about the Baptist archives short, uh, at, at the Regent's Park uh, College. In that, uh, that Baptist archives, I found a book, uh, translated, uh, a translation of Virgil's Enid, the first book of Virgil's Enid into Bengali, by a East India Company, uh, sorry, uh, the Fort William College student called Henry Sargent, which, um, had been published in 1810. It was his term paper. And that work has been mentioned in histories of Bengali literature, but no one had ever seen a copy. And it turned out that it had been miscatalogued in the British Library as an English translation of the of, the, of Enid because the first title page was in English. So for 200 years, the book had vanished from sight. Um, so miscataloging, there are other, other stories of miscataloging that I could tell you, but um, that's sort of, we are working on another such book. Uh, which, is, which is also a victim of a manuscript, which is also a victim of miscataloging, but not, not yet. So this um, particular Mahabharat was miscatalogued in the Asiatic society as under Bhagavad Gita. So when this person sent in the slip, the requisition slip to Asiatic society, he received a manuscript whose paper was quite brown, 50 years ago, so 1860s. Now it, he said it was a manuscript translation of the more important parts of the Mahabharat, which was lodged in the Library of the Asian Society of Bengal many years ago, and which there is reason to believe was drawn up by the late Professor H. H. Wilson. Now this was his, he looked at one set. Then in 1868, Theodore Goldstucker, who was a scholar of Sanskrit, um, Sanskrit scholar and uh, bibliographer, reported on the existence of two sets of rough and fair copies. A complete set was acquired by the India Office Library by the consent of Mrs. Wilson. I later found out that she had sold, sold the manuscripts of 500 pounds. One incomplete set represented the original drafts had been taken by the Bodleian Library. So if one set went to Bodleian, the incomplete draft, if the other set was sold in 1860 by Mrs. Wilson, who was hard up by all accounts to the India office, where is the third set? Is there a third set in the Asiatic Society Library now? You know, the, so what Talboy's Wheeler was looking at was the third set of their manuscripts, which is very likely in the collection of the Asiatic Society. I don't know whether they even know about this. Or whether I looked in their catalog, I could not find it. So these are this and then therefore the question which comes up is how do you then how and how is it that after the acquisition of these manuscripts, nothing there was no scholarship on them? I mean if the India office acquired them in the 1860s. If the Bodleian acquired them in the uh, round about the same time, what happened to them? Why, why is why is not a why is not a single scholar worked on them? But they have been catalogued. You cannot fault the libraries. In both the Bodleian, where first Theodore Goldstecker, then Theodore Aufrecht, then Maurice Winternitz, they have all catalogued this particular set of manuscripts. They have written sometimes in the catalog is in a handwritten edition to the uh, Oxford, uh, to the Bodleian Sanskrit catalog, um, catalog of Sanskrit words, catalog or this is a sort of, it all, and it's in the Aufrecht catalog, which is the most um, uh, reliable on Sanskrit works. It's a Latin catalog. Uh, it's a Latin catalog of Sanskrit works, which makes life very interesting for researchers. But it's, it's, it's a fantastic work, work. But then again, bits and pieces kept turning up. So again, what you need here is not just digitization. I mean, if one were able to, digitize all these Mahabharat 
rough drafts of the Mahabharata as well as the fair copy. And by the way, the fair copy was the work of four uh, Indian scholars um, whose names we know happily. Again, I mean, one of the things which I was mentioning earlier was uh, the way in which very often the names of, in, in the case of you know, missionary or imperial uh, archives, the names of Indian collaborators disappear. If you think of uh, the missionary archives in Sri Lankur, not once, not once, do the missionaries record the name of Panchanon Karmakar or Manohar Karmakar, the two smiths who worked on them. We know about them. But equally, we do not also know about many people. The only people that they recorded were those who had become Christians, who had converted and become Christians. So we know about eight or ten people who worked in the printing press, the bindery, and so on and forth. But repeatedly in their annual reports, in their statement of accounts, you will find so much paid to the native pandit, so much paid to this pandit. So the Baptists of Calcutta became slightly more conscious about this and they would name some of their quote unquote native assistants. In the entire copious archive of the Baptists, there is no mention of who the Indians were that they worked with. Not only that, there are other kinds of erasures and omissions, which again, so for example, I was mentioning uh, the um, um, Virgil's Enid, which was published by uh, Sri Lankur Press. There is no mention of that. Uh, presumably, Henry Sargent was a favorite student of Kerry, so he sort of put, published his term paper, but he did not want to write about it because that was not. Even more significantly, during 1802 to 3, the three brethren at Sri Lankur, Kerry, Marshman, and Ward, uh, and this is something which I, I think uh, is ironic in the current political context, they became the first ever publishers of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata in printed form. The, they printed the Bengali Ramayana and Mahabharata of Kashiram Dash, Kritipa Shodhan, Kashiram Dash. The print, and so the first ever printed Ramayana Mahabharata in the world was printed by Christian missionaries. Uh, but they, got a, they received a rap on their knuckles because they were told by the superiors that do not waste money on this. So this is also this is something they had to hide from their accounts. You do not find any mention in their archives about the Ramayana and the Mahabharata that they published. Because all these missions were run by crowds, crowd, were crowd funded, there were monies raised in Europe and America for translating Bibles and preaching to the heathen. What are you, how, how dare you spend the money on Ramayana and Mahabharata? You know, that's not your work. So you have to hide that somehow. You have to, that money, that account, that, there is no record in the archives that they were doing these things as well. But they kept doing these under the sub rows as it were. So, Similarly, with the case of the Wilson Mahabharat, but, but not similarly, we know the name of the, some of the people. One of them was the son of uh, Ram Komal Shen, the lexicographer, it was Tarachan Chakraborty. We know the name as the scribes. We even know that the Bengal government gave them a salary to carry, to actually, this, their salaries were paid by the government. I think probably during the time of Benting. Now again, why were they doing this? Why was this never published? To what extent did they complete the Mahabharata? That story itself becomes a story which we are also interested in, not just the translation <coughs> itself, which again will need uh, Sanskrit Sanskritists and Mahabharata scholars to be able to throw light on. So I just give these couple of examples. I think my night time is running out. As and you know, as I said, very in a very rambling way about the uh, various challenges and possibilities that the archives that we create digitally or sometimes physically or both. Um, the stories of the archives, I think, also are something which we need to uh, be interested in. And perhaps they are not inseparable from the actual content of the archives themselves. Now, uh, I, I said that a little, a little video. This is just, uh, this is nothing about what I've said so far. This is just a two minute video about what we do at the School of Cultural Text and Records, just as a kind of a I thank my colleagues uh, in the School of Cultural Text and Records, particularly Shumpal and others, for this little presentation.
these are some of the projects. Uh, this is the sort of the jewel in our crown, as it were, the Vichitra Tagore online Periodum, uh, uh, which was pioneered by Professor Shubhanta Chaudhuri. This is the two centuries of Indian print. Uh, the many um, projects are carried out under the Endangered, endangered Affairs Program, the Siletina Pretext, British Indian Association, Early Drama, and Welcome. Uh, This is a, a software tool uh, that was created. No, no, it's not. This is a historical dictionary that is an ongoing project. It is still uh, uh, and so manuscripts only and manuscripts with digital copies. So you can see Bengal primarily history of Bengali modernism as well as in art in literature. Uh, This software was developed as part of the uh, Vichita project. so much for, you, uh, for the lecture and the presentation. I think uh, we can open it up for questions. Uh, before we go into the questions, a little bit of summarization, because we already know what was it said, but I think I, I, I found it connected to the actual objective of uh, our current research and the archives and the digitalization of the archive. Um, I mean, to borrow from uh, Devida's I love archive fever and the politics of archive that Anne Stoller talked about. But we did talk about all these um, issues of the sovereign decision, what to digitize, what not to digitize, how to catalog it, miscataloging and all those things, the users, the absences, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so these are very enlightening. And uh, I have a personal question. I'll begin with that, and then you open it for others. Uh, personally. I'm interested also to know a little bit more about the uh, Baptist mission. Uh, I looked into their um, house at the College Street, uh, found it in a pretty bad shape, and they couldn't say anything about it. Uh, if you can throw more light on available archives on the Baptist mission in Kolkata, that would be very helpful for me. Now, uh, questions from others. You can ask questions both in Bengali as well as in English. Bye. Can I just answer this? Uh, 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 the you see, part of the collections, I, I do not know whether the Bible Society here has, as you said, you, know, you have just looked at that collection, but uh, there is a very substantial collection the Foreign and Bible Society at the Cambridge University Library. They are, they hold that particular, including all the early Bengali Bibles. So you know, there were two Baptist missions. One was the Sirampur, one was Calcutta. They had a fight between themselves. Uh, around about 1817, 
the younger brethren accused the older brethren of financial uh, irregularity. And, they, and then they, for 40 kilometers, so the, it was quite a strange, there were two Baptist missions within 40 kilometers of each other. And in 1832, they got back together again. So, but the Calcutta Baptists, for a while, sort of struck out on their own. Now, all these, the fruit of that second innings, as it were, uh, much of that materialism came in. You know, it was part of the Foreign and Bible Society. And that's a very rich holding as well. Again, um, and well worth looking at. Uh, as But in uh, Kolkata, I suppose you will find some material but related in the Bishop's College uh, library. And, but again, I have been meaning to go there and make some contact with them. Uh, but again, whether they have... These are all archives waiting to be, I suppose, discovered uh, and worked on. But uh, these well, access may not be always very easy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Professor Gupta, for a very enlightening lecture. I have two uh, concerns or queries out of personal curiosity. Um, we know about the 1853 Woods Dispatch, about how they wanted to uh, in, uh, encourage the downward filtration policy of Western education and encouraging education in India. Do we see reflections of such British administrative policies and archiving in 19th century? Because you spoke about the concern about translating Mahabharat and you know why it was a certain amount of fund uh, being used, and then there was a subterfuge of trying to hide any records of having done so. Uh, my second concern is about personal archives, the say personal letters or diaries or what we say as for the uh, you know at what point of time do we find that there are such epistemic anxieties about actually using that as an archive? At what point does the personal archive actually get considered as a real or uh, an archive worth considering? Well, these are both very <laughs> difficult questions. So the first one, I think, uh, is uh, the two instances that uh, I was talking about were both pre Woods Dispatch. I mean, you know, if you're looking at Baptist and Mahabharata, that's the early 19th century. When in any case, you see, the Orientalist project and the missionary project were completely different. I mean, if you were the, uh, for the London Missionary Society, which was the parent body of LMS work, the Baptists, their aim was quite narrow, and that was to promote uh, Bible translation in, uh, in, that, in this part of the world. Um, so the congruence between missionary and uh, company interest, 1813 Charter Act, that there is a degree of confidence, but it's not a very... And you also know that the missionaries were involved in... <coughs> uh, sort of the early pedagogy, which there was a common moment again. But this was very much a fraught relationship with, between the missionaries and the company. So and even in the case of uh, Wilson, uh, you're looking at a pre-Macaulay, pre-utilitarian um, kind of moment, which is not influenced by later uh, um, political or pedagogical uh, decision making. So I think all of these missed opportunities um, all of these are part of the early company company era where you are kind of a and I am not an expert on this particular period but uh, kind of on the one hand a certain kind of uh, scholarly interest uh, not in the contemporary South Asia but in the classical antiquity which in Asian society and others the works of a large number of Orientalists um, bear, bear witness to and Wilson was perhaps the most Energetic among all of them. I mean, if you look, I think one one way of, you know, if you look at Horopushat Shastri's catalogues of the multi volume catalogue of the Asian society, in, which he created in the late 19th century, you get some sense of the um, volume of work which was being done. And also, this consisted of a collection of manuscripts, you see, uh, the, a huge amount of manuscripts, as well as other kind of, uh, you know, epigraphy coins, etc. collected. But the Woods Dispatch, I, I think, would be a different kind of a... As far as private archives, I really have no idea. I mean, this is something which various people here would be able to talk about when... And one of the things, this was raised at the recent EAP, uh, one of the training programs, is do we also consider private archives as part of... I think said, yes, the answer was yes, very much so. But when this became a kind of a, a, a epistemic shift in our understanding of... You know, I, I don't really know, perhaps... Uh, others and, and uh, would be able to throw more light on this. Um, 
I mean, we of course know of private private collections, the private libraries, which had become quite institutionalized, even the, uh, Dr. Johnson's library, the Coldridge's library had from the very beginning become, been recognized as such, but uh, uh, and, as, as, as uh, you know, consider, uh, as private archives, but uh, as part of our approach to our archive creating, I, I can't answer it, I'm afraid, but if there, maybe somebody would, else would have, have a go at this. Sorry about that. ধন্যবাদ আমার একটা প্রশ্ন আছে তারক চন্দ্র চূড়ামণি ভারতবর্ষীয় সম্প্রদায় শিল্প এই পত্রিকার টু সেঞ্চুরিজ ইন্ডিয়ান বুকস থেকে আমি এখানে কোনো ক্যাটালগে কোথাও কিছু না আপনি পাবেন না কারণ ওরা কোনো সাময়িক পত্র বা কোনো পত্র পত্রিকা ডিজিটাইজ করেননি সেটা আমি ওদের প্রস্তাব দিয়েছিলাম যে এবং এটা ভবিষ্যতে যাবো হলেও হতে পারে কারণ টু সেঞ্চুরিজের ওদের একটা প্রশ্ন ছিল এরপরে আমরা কী করবো এই অবশ্যই অন্য ভারতীয় ভাষায় এই প্রজেক্ট এটার একটা সেই জন্য প্রথম কথা এক ধরনের বিপ্লোগ্রাফিক কন্ট্রোল দরকার সেটা অনেক ক্ষেত্রেই নেই যে কোথায় কোন গ্রন্থাগারে কী অবস্থায় কোন টাইটেল রয়েছে সেটা না যতক্ষণ না যাচ্ছে ততক্ষণে তো সেভাবে নির্বাচন করা যাবে না কিন্তু পত্র পত্রিকা সাময়িক পত্র বিশেষ করে এটা এটার কথা আমি বলেছিলাম কিন্তু ব্রিটিশ লাইব্রেরিতে খুব বেশি সাময়িক পত্র নেই আছে কিছু বিক্ষিপ্তভাবে আছে যেমন আমরা জানি যে সেন্টার ফর স্টাইল সোশ্যাল সায়েন্সেস সেখানে প্রচুর এই ধরনের সাময়িক পত্র ডিজিটাইজ করা হয়েছে যেগুলি এখন নয় হাইডেলবার্গ ক্রস সালিফাতে রয়েছে কিন্তু এছাড়া এটা কিন্তু খুব প্রয়োজন কারণ পত্র বই হয়তো মানে যেটা আমরা বুক বলি বা ইন্ডিভিজুয়াল বুকস সেটাকে সেগুলি হয়তো খুঁজলেও গ্রন্থাকারে পাওয়া যাবে কিন্তু অনেক সাময়িক পত্র অনেক সংবাদপত্র সেগুলি অনেক সংখ্যায় হারিয়ে গেছে এবং সেগুলিকে আবার বার করার ফলে কোনো কোনো রকম প্রত্নতাত্ত্বিক কোনো আমাদের কাছে আর সেরকম কোনো উপায় নেই কিন্তু তাও যেগুলি আছে এবং সেগুলির অবস্থাও অনেক ক্ষেত্রে খুবই খারাপ সেগুলি কুড়ি এবার বিয়েবাড়ি একটা করা উচিত এটা তো আমি মনে করি কিন্তু সেটা কতদূর করা যাবে আমার মানে সন্দিগ্ধ সেবা করে এবং সেটা নানা নানা জায়গায় ছড়িয়েছি ঠিক আছে ওকে তো একটা ভালো ভালো বলতে পারবে যে কিছু কিছু বলতে চাই সাধারণই সেগুলো আমরা কিছু পাচ্ছি কিছু সংখ্যা পাচ্ছি বা কিছু সংখ্যা পাচ্ছি না কিছু অন্য ধরনের কিছু মৌলিক সূত্র আছে সেটা ধরুন রিপোর্টস অন নেটিভ নিউজ পেপারস যেগুলি আঠারোশো আশি থেকে প্রত্যেক সপ্তাহে ব্রিটিশ রাজতন্ত্রের মধ্যেই ঘোরাফেরা করতো সেখানে এক ধরনের চুম্বকে পাওয়া যায় যে কত সপ্তাহে প্রত্যেক কবে কবে কী বলছেন মানে কোন বিশেষ কোনো গুরুত্বপূর্ণ বিষয় সেখানে আমরা একটা মোটামুটি সংবাদ ক্ষতি আন পাচ্ছি কিন্তু সেগুলো সংবাদপত্রে সেগুলো বোধ হয় সাময়িক পত্রের মধ্যে ফলে এগুলি পাওয়া একটু কঠিন ভারতবর্ষীয় সন্ধ্যা পত্রিকা যেটা ব্রহ্মবান্ধ উপাধ্যায় সম্পাদনা করতেন তার কোন সম্প্রতি করেছিলাম কিন্তু সেগুলি এটা সত্যি একটা প্রজেক্ট হিসেবে ভাবা যেতে পারে কারণ
ঠিক প্রশ্ন নয় কৌতূহল যে আমরা যদি অতটাও পেছনে না যাই আর একটু আজকের কাছাকাছি সময় এগিয়ে আসি সোভিয়েত রাশিয়া থেকে একটা সময় বাংলায় প্রচুর সাময়িক পত্রিকার পাবলিকেশন হয়েছে তার কি কোনো আকার বিধি হয়েছে কখনো বা স্কুল অফ কালচারাল টেক্সের কি এরকম কোনো ইচ্ছে আছে বাংলা লিটল ম্যাগাজিনের যে ইতিহাস মনে করা হচ্ছে কিন্তু এটা এখন সময় সবাই খবর করে এটা এক্ষুনি কিছু বলা উচিত হবে না সম্বন্ধে আর সোভিয়েট প্রকাশনা এবং বাংলা প্রকাশনা এটা একটা এইটা নিয়ে তিনি কাজ করেছেন এবং তার কোথায় পিএইচডি হয়ে গেছে খুবই সেই গবেষণা সন্দর্ভে প্রকাশ হলে হয়তো অনেকটাই আমরা এই প্রশ্নের উত্তর করে পাবো জেসিকা বাকম্যান বলে এক গবেষক ওয়াশিংটন স্টেট ইউনিভার্সিটিতে তিনি সেন্ট পিটার্সবার্গের যে মাফেজ খানা ওখানে সেখানে গিয়েছিলেন তিনি রাশিয়ানও জানেন বাংলাও জানেন এবং অনেকগুলি ভারতীয় ভাষা জানেন তো উনি যেটা বলেছেন ফুলব্রাইট স্কলারশিপে এসেছিলেন কলকাতায় সেখানে তখন যাদবপুরে ছিলেন কিছুদিন ওনার খুব কয়েকটা মানে খুব যে পর্যবেক্ষণ সেটা একটা হচ্ছে যে ওখানকার অনেক চিঠিপত্র পাওয়া যায় এখানকার ভারতীয় যারা পাঠক তারা একটা কোনো গল্প বা ইয়ে পড়ে তারা চিঠি লিখতেন যে আমরা এটা আরও মুখ এই সায়েন্স ফিকশন একটা কাহিনিটা করতে চাই আপডেট অনুবাদ করুন এই চিঠিপত্রগুলো ওখানে পাওয়া যাচ্ছে এক নম্বর এবং সবচেয়ে মাঝে মাঝে উনি সেই চিঠিপত্র যারা লিখেছেন তাদের কয়েকজনকে যোগাযোগ করতে পেরেছেন তাদের মধ্যে একজন এখন ঢাকায় বিদ্যুৎ পর্ষদের প্রধান তিনি ছোটবেলায় একটা চিঠি লিখেছিলেন বিশেষ করে যে টাইপ গুলো আমরা সোভিয়েত বইগুলো দেখি সেই টাইপ গুলো কিন্তু এখানকার প্রকাশকদের হায়দ্রাবাদের টাইপ নয় সেই এটা কিন্তু সোভিয়েত ইউনিয়নের তৈরি করা বাংলা টাইপ এবং সেগুলি যে গবেষণা এবং সেগুলি যে টাইপের যে খসরা সেই কাগজগুলো উনি পেয়েছেন তারা তো সোভিয়েট আমাদের বই ডিস্ট্রিবিউট করতেন সেখানে এখনো কিছু অনেক সময় প্রকাশকদের কাছে ডিস্ট্রিবিউটরদের কাছে পড়ে থাকে সেখানে যদি বইগুলো ওই বইগুলো কিন্তু একটা সংগ্রহ থাকলে একটা খুব মূল্যবান জিনিস হবে কিন্তু সেটা কোথায় পাওয়া যাবে জানি না খানিকটা ক্রাউড সোর্স কিন্তু আপনি বলতে পারবেন কিছু বই পুনঃপ্রকাশ করেছে একলাত্র আমি যেহেতু একটা সংগ্রহ নিজের একটা সংগ্রহশালা আছে আমার ছোটখাটো তো সেক্ষেত্রে দেখেছি যে অনেক এই যে যেমন রাশিয়ান বইগুলো বলছেন এমন কিছু সংগ্রহ আছে যারা শুধুমাত্র রাশিয়ান সমস্ত বই সংগ্রহ করেন আমার জানা এরকম তিন চার জনা আছেন যারা যাদের কাছে প্রচুর সংখ্যায় রাশিয়ান বই শুধুমাত্র ওদের সংগ্রহ ধরনটাই আছে রাশিয়ান বইয়ের উপর রাশিয়ান বাংলা বই সংগ্রহ করেছেন এবং তাদের কাছে গেলে তারা আশা করছি যারা কাজ করবে তাদেরকে সাহায্য করতে পারবেন যেমন অরুণ সোম বা সমস সেনের কিছু অনুবাদ করে সোভিয়েট ছোট মানে একলব্য বলে একটি প্রকাশনা বা কল্প বিশ্বটা কিন্তু কিছু কিছু বার করেছে অনুমতি নিয়েই সে অনুবাদকদের কাছ থেকে যারা জীবিত আছেন বা তাদের পরিবার সমস্যা সেনের পরিবার অরুণ সোম তো এখন জীবিত আছেন কিন্তু এদের যে ওই মানে আরটা যেতে দেখি যে বাংলার সত্য যেখানে ফরফ তৈরি হচ্ছে এই চিঠিপত্র ওই এই জিনিসগুলো তো পাওয়া যায় না কিন্তু বইগুলোই যত তো পাওয়া যায় সেটা তো এই কিছু না কিছু গ্রাউন্ড সোর্স করে কিছু ওই ডিবিট গোরকি সদরে থাকতে পারে ন্যাশনাল বুক এজেন্সিতে থাকতে পারে না এই বইগুলো তো ঘরে ঘরে আমাদের অনেক কারো কারো আছে ওখানে হ্যাঁ সেটা আউট সোর্সিং করে এখন জোগাড় করে দেবে ওগুলো কিন্তু অতটা খারাপ কিছু না কিন্তু খুব ভালো প্রোডাকশন ছিল ফলে ওগুলো ইও হয়নি মানে এটা হয়তো অনেকের না জানা যে সোভিয়েত রাশিয়ার যে বাংলা বই 
তার একটা ইন্টারনেট আর্কাইভ আছে সোমনাথ দাশগুপ্ত বলে একটি ছেলে নিজের আগ্রহে বইগুলি ডিজিটাইজ করেছে সেগুলি সেখানে পাওয়া যায় যারা চান তারা দেখতে পারেন এবং তার জন্য কোনো পয়সা দিতে হয় না আমার নিজের কাছে ব্যক্তিগতভাবে দেড় হাজার সবিত্রাশের বই আছে বাংলার কিন্তু এরকম অনেকের কাছেই আছে সেটাতে এই লিটল ম্যাগাজিন মূলত কলকাতা ভিত্তিক লিটল ম্যাগাজিন নয় তার বাইরে যে লিটল ম্যাগাজিন তারপর কলকাতা ভিত্তিক লিটল ম্যাগাজিনের একটা তাও আর্কাই হয়তো অলরেডি আসছে কিন্তু আমরা অনেক এরকম লিটল ম্যাগাজিন দেখতে পেয়েছি বা জানতে পেরেছি লিটল কথা অনেকে জানেন না সেটাকে আমরা করছি আর্কাই তো এই প্রসেসটা চলছে আই এস এর জায়গা থেকে সেটা একটা বা হতে পারে হয়তো আমরা আবার ধন্যবাদ জানাচ্ছি অধ্যাপক অভিজিৎ গুপ্তকে তার মূল্যবান বক্তব্যের জন্য এবং তারপরে যে প্রশ্ন উত্তর পর্ব চলল সেটা আমাদের সবাইকে খুব আলোকপাত করেছে বিভিন্ন বিষয়ে অ্যান্ড উই হোপ দ্যাট উইল গেট দ্য অপরচুনিটি ওয়ান সেকেন্ড টু লার্ন ফ্রম প্রফেসর গুপ্ত এবং আমাদের যে কনভারসেশন উইথ যাদবপুর ইউনিভার্সিটি স্কুল অফ কালচারকে চলতে থাকবো আমরা এবার পরবর্তী বক্তার বক্তব্য শোনাতে এগিয়ে যাবো আমরা শিডিউলটা একটু চেঞ্জ করছি আমাদের পরবর্তী বক্তা শ্রী অভিজিৎ ভট্টাচার্য অভিজিৎ ভট্টাচার্য ইজ ডকুমেন্টেশন আর্কাইভ অফিসার সেন্টার ফর স্টাডিজ ইন সোশ্যাল সায়েন্সেস ক্যালকাটা আমি